Imagine stepping into a room lined with rubber, a last resort against the violent uncertainties of space travel. This isn't the setting of a science fiction story. It's a very real chapter in the saga of human ingenuity. From a rubber room designed to be the ultimate safe haven for astronauts to ingenious hacks and close calls that were never broadcast, we're about to uncover the hidden gems that you didn't know about the missions that took humanity to another world. The Apollo program relied on the Saturn V rocket. When adding up the kerosene and liquid hydrogen fuel of all three stages, it carried an insane 42 terajoules of potential explosive energy that it released in a controlled manner to carry the United States' first astronauts to the moon. To understand just how much energy this is, consider that it's a full two-thirds that released by the little boy atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. That gives it about a thousand times the energy of the US military tree's most powerful conventional bomb. In other words, if that reaction got out of control, it could be one hell of an explosion. And if anyone wanted to survive it, it was going to take a hell of a bunker. And those bunkers were the rubber rooms. Located underneath the launch pads at Kennedy Space Center, the rubber room served as a last resort protection for launch pad crew and the astronauts themselves in case of an explosion. It was capable of supporting 20 people for up to 24 hours. However, the really interesting thing about the rubber rooms, and the reason that they earned that nickname, was the way in. The launch pad crew had to slide down a 200-foot chute, that's about 60 meters, that popped them right into a little rubber-padded reception room of sorts. From there, they had to open a massive steel door to enter the actual bunker, which consisted of a domed ceiling and concrete floor suspended on shock-absorbing springs. The astronauts had a longer journey, having to take an elevator down the 320-foot launch tower, around 100 meters, to the launch pad in just 30 seconds, from which they'd transfer to the chute. Getting out, wasn't so easy. You either had to exit through a 1,200 foot long air duct, which is 365 meters, or through an escape hatch in the roof. Obviously, the rockets and landers of the Apollo program get all the engineering glory, but the ingenuity of the bunkers was no small feat. They could withstand a fireball 1,400 feet wide, 430 meters, burning at 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 1,400 Celsius. They could also protect their occupants from explosive pressures of up to 500 pounds per square inch and 75 Gs of acceleration, about 15 times what an untrained human can normally withstand. Though an admiral precaution, the rubber rooms were never used beyond training. When the Apollo program ended, NASA abandoned them, after which they were filled with water, and nature promptly took them back, as tends to happen in Florida. NASA eventually refurbished the launch pads for the Space Shuttle program, but left the rubber rooms as they were. Currently, SpaceX rents the pads, but the terms of the lease require them to leave the rubber rooms preserved as historical artifacts. Have you ever found yourself caught in the age-old dilemma? Boxes too loose? Briefs too tight while threatened? not because today's video is brought to you by sheath underwear. I'm currently wearing a pair of sheath. I've got a clean pair of sheath right here. I don't think these have ever been worn. You're very welcome. Wouldn't want to show you my dirty underwear. With sheath, there is no more discomfort, no more awkward adjustments, just pure comfort. Whether it's a scorching summer day or the depths of winter, sheath keep everything cool and comfortable and in check. They've got this dual pouch system for your uh, various parts, which sounds, you know, you might think, you do with the what now? But try it. Buy a pair of sheath underwear, and then the next thing you know, you'll be back at sheath, and you'll be buying more underwear. And then, like me, your underwear drawer will just be full of sheath, because it's perfect. Sheath's stretchy fabric is crafted with moisture wicking technology, which keeps you cool, ensures everything stays in the right place. It's just perfect. Or if you're not into the pouch system that day, you could just wear it like regular undies. With the holiday season around the corner, sheath makes the perfect gift. And guess what? They've got new seasonal designs, winter-ready base layers, and even a bamboo women's line. Head over to sheathunderwear.com and revolutionize your underwear game. Use the promo code SIDEPROJECTS for an exclusive 20% off your order. Yep, 20% off with sheath. There's also a link below. And now let's get back to today's episode. Thank you, sheath. On November the 19th, 1969, the Apollo 12 mission, crewed by Pete Conrad, Richard Gordon, and Alan Bean, made the second ever man landing on the moon. Having already beat the Soviets to the moon with Apollo 11, Apollo 12 was considerably more relaxed. For example, the launch date was pushed back two months to provide for more training and allow President Richard Nixon to attend. In fact, the astronauts even took hammocks with them to deploy on the lunar surface. NASA really wanted to make it look like they could now reach the moon with ease, which is why they didn't publicize many of the unforeseen obstacles, like the rocket getting struck by lightning. 
twice. The launch was scheduled for the 14th of November 1969 from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Because this date coincided with ideal landing conditions on the moon, there was only a launch window of about three hours. However, it also coincided with stormy weather. Overcast and rainy skies, as well as wind speeds of 175 miles per hour or 280 kilometers per hour, which was the strongest faced by any Apollo launch. Plus, there was a cumulonimbus cloud above the launch site, which should have canceled the launch based on NASA rules, but they waived the restriction and the launch went ahead. 36 seconds after liftoff, a lightning bolt struck the Saturn V rocket, and the voltage surge disconnected all three of the Apollo spacecraft's fuel cells, which gave power to the internal electrical systems from the main electrical bus. The yellow caution lights erupted across the control panel for the fuel cells, and the master alarm blared in the astronauts' headsets. Yet none of them had noticed any physical disturbances, and the rocket continued lifting them out of the atmosphere with 7.5 million pounds of thrust. Then, just 16 seconds later, another bolt struck the rocket. Once again, the three astronauts didn't notice anything but sudden chaos on the control panel. This time, it lit up red, indicating that the inertial guidance system couldn't be detected. That meant they had no way to judge the position, acceleration, and attitude of their ascent through the atmosphere, arguably the most dangerous part of the mission. The flight director slash attitude indicator, nicknamed the eight ball, began spinning wildly. The crew and mission in Houston couldn't figure out what was wrong, and in fact, everything other than the control panel seemed to be working just fine. Nonetheless, the astronauts could hardly continue flying blind, and anxiety built as mission control scrambled to figure out what exactly was wrong with the apparently malfunctioning spacecraft. Luckily, John Aaron, the engineer manning the computer receiving electrical data from Apollo, quickly noticed a pattern in the seemingly random readings that reminded him of a telemetry failure during a prior test. He realized the solution and radioed his superior flight director, Jerry Griffin. Try SCE to AUKS. He said. Griffin had no idea what this meant, but trusted enough in Aaron's judgment to relay the message to the astronauts who also didn't understand. What the hell is that? was Pete Conrad's response. However, thinking quickly, they deduced that this meant to turn the signal conditioning equipment, SCE, to auxiliary battery power. A simple flip of the switch brought the instruments back online one minute and 48 seconds after launch. Ultimately, the launch was successful and the astronauts entered Earth orbit. After reconnecting the instrument panels to the fuel cell and checking everything was in working order, they ignited the third stage and continued on their four day journey to lunar orbit. However, even with boots on the moon, the mission's most notable feat might be the astronauts' recent setting of their instrument panel in barely over a minute, all while under nearly four Gs of force, about that of your average roller coaster. When Neil Armstrong took the first steps on the moon on the 20th of July 1969, some 650 million people worldwide tuned in to watch the televised video recording. However, few people, especially those used to the ease of modern digital video transmission, realized how much of a feat that was in and of itself. That's because Apollo's recording equipment and transmission to Earth was via SSTV, which stands for Slow Scan Television. This method transmits static pictures at 10 frames per second over radio waves. By for the early lunar missions because it only requires 3 kHz of bandwidth. However, the televisions of the 60s were designed to receive and display in the NTSC standard, which runs at 30 frames per second and requires 6 MHz of bandwidth. The raw video footage from the moon had to be converted, but NASA couldn't exactly just download VLC media player in order to do this. Instead, they employed a considerably cruder method. They received the SSTV transmission onto a compatible 10-inch monitor while simply pointing a TV camera at it using the NTSC broadcast standard. This was done in multiple locations all over the globe to allow for worldwide broadcast. Unfortunately, though, this significantly lowered the video quality, particularly the contrast, brightness, and resolution, meaning that no one but a few technicians and those doing the video conversion saw the original images. Of course, we now have much more sophisticated video conversion techniques, right? Surely NASA could feed the original SSTV recording through computer software to remaster it and develop beautiful digital images images of the original moon landing. Well, they could if they hadn't lost the bloody tapes. Originally, NASA recorded the raw SSTV signal onto 25mm analog magnetic data tapes. In the early 2000s, once technology emerged that could convert them to higher quality, officials found that they'd disappeared, which they finally admitted to the public in 2006. Though it's likely they were erased and reused during a tape shortage in the 80s, and despite an ever-shrinking supply of machinery capable of reading the tapes, NASA maintains hope that they'll turn up in one of their many archive centers.
The internet is filled with memes pointing out that the cell phone in your pocket is several orders of magnitude more powerful than the computer that took the astronauts to the moon. It's true, your smartphone does indeed have around a million times the RAM of the Apollo guidance computer's 4 kilobytes and 100,000 times its 0.43 megahertz processing power, not to mention some 7 million times its 7 kilobytes of permanent storage, which was in the form of core rote memory and read only. However, this fails to acknowledge just how revolutionary and capable this computer really was. After all, it allowed the Apollo spacecraft to fly almost entirely by wire, that is, without manual human control, except during lunar landings. The most interesting thing about the AGC was that it was the first computer in the world based on silicon integrated circuits, the basis of the modern microchip. The use of silicon as a semiconductor material provided for much larger numbers of miniaturized transistors in one place than previous computers, which allowed for easy mass production and use in household devices. But first of all, it let it fit inside a spaceship. Where the AGC's limited capacity really came into play was user interface. It was a far cry from you screaming at Siri to find you the next Taco Bell. Instead, the astronauts used an interface called Display and Keyboard, or DSKY. However, the keyboard was really just a number pad, and the crew could enter commands consisting of two two-digit numbers, the first representing a verb and the second a noun. For example, verb 06, noun 62 would display the current velocity, altitude rate, and altitude. Interestingly, these would be converted into imperial units, even though the computer itself calculated a metric. Despite this simple input and output, the software written in a specific AGC assembly language required 1,400 human years of work, well over 12.2 million human hours, or the equivalent of around 18 lifespans. The team was led by Margaret Hamilton, the director of the Software Engineering Division of the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory. She ended up winning the Presidential Medal of Freedom for her work on the AGC software, which on paper formed a stack taller than she was. The software went went on to play a role in the computers used in Skylab and space shuttle programs, as well as fly-by-wire military aircraft. It's also all available on GitHub today if you want to take a crack at flying a rocket ship with little more than a number pad. Audio communication was key during the Apollo missions, but the spacesuits made it difficult, not to mention the roar of the rockets. To solve this, NASA designed the communications carrier assembly to provide each astronaut with two earphones and two microphones for redundancy. The assembly completely wrapped around an astronaut's head with a large white band on top and bulky black housings for the earphones, leading to the nickname Snoopy Cap. However, as interesting as the engineering of the Snoopy Cap is, more interesting are the candid hot mic moments captured by it that give us a glimpse into the mind of an Apollo astronaut. Here are some of the best examples. When Apollo 12 took human beings to the moon for the second time, Pete Conrad, who was just 5 foot 6 or 168 centimeters tall, considerably shorter than his crewmates, stepped onto the lunar surface with a joking attitude, Man, that may have been a small one for Neil, but that's a long one for me. After finishing a chat with Mission Control, Apollo 16 commander John Young informed his crewmate Charlie Duke he was having some digestive problems exacerbated by his enclosed spacesuit. I have the farts again. He said through the Snoopy cap. I got him, Charlie. Although most people know Neil Armstrong's first words on the moon, the Snoopy cap also captured Buzz Aldrin's particularly poignant reaction to the lunar surface during Apollo 11. Beautiful view, magnificent desolation. In 1972, during Apollo 17, the last manned mission to the moon, astronauts Gene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt sang The Fountain in the Park while strolling across the lunar surface, substituting the word moon for park. Cernan also capped the Apollo program, and to date was humanity's last man on the moon, with the final words before liftoff being, We leave as we came, and God willing, as we shall return, with peace and hope.